and Imam Ibn al-Qayyim rahimahullah, he says something very powerful about the way that Adam alayhi salam was created. And he says rahimahullah ta'ala that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not command the malaika to prostrate to Adam alayhi salam until after he breathed into it the soul of Adam alayhi salam, the ruh of Adam alayhi salam. You know that's extremely powerful because basically what Imam al-Qayyim rahimahullah says is that the soul is more worthy of being paid attention to than the jasad, than the body. Because before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala placed the soul in Adam alayhi salam, he literally was just that, a lump of flesh. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala venerated it. And you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uses that term, that, وَنَفَخَ فِيهِ مِنْ رُوحِ That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala breathed into him from his spirit. You know, subhanAllah, just a few months ago, I was, I heard someone actually saying that that means we all carry Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala inside of us. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says it's His ruh, and so we all have the ruh of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala inside of us. But in reality, that is Allah's way of venerating it. The same way that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala calls the Kaaba Baytullah. Okay, a lot of people might, you might have believed this growing up in Sunday school, I know I did, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala lives inside the black box of the Kaaba. Allah doesn't live inside the Kaaba. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala venerated the Kaaba by calling it Baytullah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when he calls the naqa, the she camel, naqatullah, it doesn't literally mean Allah's she camel, it's Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala venerating it. So when we think about this, the ruh of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that Allah chose to venerate it to that extent, to say, وَنَفَخَ فِيهِ مِنْ رُوحِ Now I don't want to go into a long discussion about the difference between ruh and nafs, because that's what I was asked to talk about. That is an extremely academic discussion, much difference of opinion, and I guarantee you, you will be lost and I will be lost by the time I finish talking about it. But just quickly, the ruh, the soul, the spirit that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given to us is something that will continue on for eternity. And you know, you might think to yourself, when did the ruh start? After Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created it, it's, it's really beautiful that Rasulullah mentioned something in, a, in an authentic hadith from Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha, that al-arwah junood mujannada, that the souls are like drafted soldiers. Whoever they had an affinity towards previously, they will have an affinity towards in dunya. And whoever they did not incline towards previously, they will not incline towards in dunya. So when you tell someone, I've hated you forever, you might be telling the truth. And if I tell you that I've loved you forever, I loved you in a previous realm, then I'm telling you the truth. And Imam al-Sha'bi rahimahullah, he told his wife, he said, how beautiful it is, is it that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wrote your name next to mine 50,000 years before the entire creation. MashaAllah. There's a reason why his name was the Sha'bi, the popular Sha'bi, because he knew how to really get people going, MashaAllah. So that's what he said to his wife. So in reality, even when we come close to each other, when we find love for each other, when we have affinity towards each other, whenever we click, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made that so special that that was before we even got here. And SubhanAllah, there is no other nation, no other group of people where you have people that meet each other for the first time and wallahi, there is love. There is a true hub fi sabilillah, a true love for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And it's like, I've seen you before, I've known you before. And you might be telling the truth because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allows the arwah to gather together, to love one another in the previous realm and in the future realm also. That verily Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about the lives of the shuhada, the souls of the shuhada. And Rasulullah opened it to the, to the believers. That in Al Barza, in another realm, although the believers are not alive in dunya, they're not walking around and hanging out at people's house, they don't show up after 40 days and eat biryani with you, but they're alive with each other and they visit each other and they gather together. And subhanAllah, what a beautiful gathering that truly is. Yastabashirun, and they're excited, they're rejoicing for those who have not yet joined them. So that leaves us here. Where do we stand with all of this? Now Imam Ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah, 
This was also the position of, of my teacher, Shaykh Amr al Ashqam, rahimahullah ta'ala, who just passed away a few weeks ago. He said that the terms ruh and nafs are actually interchangeable. There's no difference between the two. But as far as the usage is concerned, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes the soul and the body coming together in the dunya sense, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes it as nafs. So it is the ruh, but it's come together. Then, you know, the body and the soul. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala now gives you a choice. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives you a level of free will. Although it's not absolute free will, you do have a level of free will. And for that reason, you have desires. You've got to fight those desires. And we are not like the other creations. And that's why Imam Ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah, he continued a very beautiful statement. He says that the more a person forbids his nafs, forbids his self from their carnal desires, the closer they become to the malaika, to the angels, although we'll never become angels. And the more he allows himself to indulge in all of his carnal desires, the closer he becomes to being an animal. Think about it. Territory, food, um, what, you know, that's all that animals look for. And we, we see it today. Some human beings literally act like animals. They just pursue their, they pursue their desires the way that an animal would. There's absolutely nothing, nothing holding them back. You know, to the point that Rasulullah says, It's like a dog, always panting. The tongue is always out, you know, just salivating at whatever is in front of it. There is nothing that holds that person back. So that nafs enjoys living like an animal. But the angels enjoy ibadah. They love worship. They gather, not just on Laylatul Qadr, around gatherings like this insha'Allah, where people are remembering Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Circles of knowledge. They descend upon people that are worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and they don't have, they don't have free will. They don't have any choice or desires for food or drink or anything like that. Their enjoyment, their source, their, their, their life comes through ibadah, through pleasing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So when a person gets to a point where they're literally forbidding themselves from just going after all of those desires, they become angelic without being angels. They get close to being like the malaika. And that's a really beautiful expression. Al-Asfad ibn Salam, rahimahullah ta'ala, one of the great tabi'een, said something very powerful. And I want you to think about this, and this is on a whole other level. And that's why the nafs that is close to the angel is like an nafs al-mutma'inna. The soul that is at peace with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Aswad ibn Salam rahimahullah. He said, for me to do two rak'ahs, for me to do two rak'ahs, for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, is more beloved to me than Jannah and everything in it. Can you imagine that statement? Two rak'ahs is more beloved to me than everything that Jannah has to offer. And why is that? Why would he say something like that? He said, because the two rak'ahs that I do, they're for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Jannah is for me. SubhanAllah, Allahu Akbar. Look at the level of devotion that these people reach. The two rak'ahs is for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Jannah is for me. And that's why the greatest, the greatest reward of a person that, that is at that level where they're forbidding their desires, they're just trying to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They're consistently returning the nafs to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When Allah refers to it in Surah Al-Fajr, Ya ayyatuha nafsul mutma'inna O soul that is at peace, irji'i ila rabbik radiya mardiya Come back to your Lord, pleasing and pleased. And some of the scholars said that the reason why they're told pleasing first is because that is truly what, what satisfies them. Pleasing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, getting to that point. Now I know that if we just talk about that high level all night long, and I guarantee you I'm not at that level, and I don't know who would claim to be at that level, that you know we'll just get dis disillusioned and disoriented and think to ourselves, wow, the Sahaba were awesome, the Tabi'in were awesome, and we can't be like them. But where does this all come from? How do we find that balance? Where do we fall into that, that, that spectrum? Many times we think to ourselves, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guides and misguides and we have nothing to do with that. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala places a burden on you and I. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, فَلَمَّا أَزَابُوا أَزَابَ اللَّهُ قُرُوبًا For example, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, when they turned away, Allah turned their hearts away. So when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us about the nafs, 
When he tells us about ourselves, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala always places the burden on who? On him or on us? On us. Right? You know, sometimes I'll, I'll, you'll see someone that's totally away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Make dua for me. You know, make dua that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala takes me out of this situation. Why don't you start praying? Make dua for me to start praying. Why don't you leave, you know, this haram living? Why don't you abandon this relationship? If Allah wants me to leave it, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will make me leave it. That's the way some of us think sometimes. Like Allah is going to force me into that situation and I have absolutely nothing to do with this, right? And, and that's a very dangerous way of thinking. But in reality, it's you and I. قَدْ أَفْلَحَ مَنْ تَزَكَّى Verily, he, who, he has succeeded, who has succeeded in purifying himself. SubhanAllah, think about that. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Surah Al-A'la, Surah Al-Shams, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala places the burden of tazkiyah on you and I. You've got to make the effort to consistently purify yourself, to consistently turn back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to consistently return to your fitrah, to consistently return to the way Allah created you in the first place. Now think about that for a moment. When, you know, the brother recited the very beautiful verses from Surah Al-Hajj, speaking about the fitrah that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created us all on. We all live and die by that. We go back to the fitrah or we ruin ourselves. And I want you to think about this for a moment. We like to blame the shaitan when we mess up, right? After Ramadan was over, you can see everybody's Facebook statuses and everybody's Twitter accounts, even though us, you know, uh, great scholars, we were not on Facebook and we're not on Twitter, right? But no, we see. And that wasn't a mockery of them, that was a mockery of myself. So I apologize to Sheikh Yasser, but you know, we see what people are saying. And I know it's, 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 un, it's, it's funny because you'll see someone talk about, I was so good in Ramadan, I wasn't doing anything bad. You know, mashallah, I was able to abandon everything that, you know, I was like one of the Sahaba that after Ramadan, you know, Shaitan got to me. And I'm done. Right? I'm doing exactly the same things I was doing before Ramadan. We blame Shaitan so quick. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala between the angelic self and between the animal-like self is what self? al nafs al At the very least, a soul that blames itself. al nafs al And Shaitan, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us about the speech of Shaitan on the Day of Judgment. When Shaitan says, فَلَا تَلُوُّونِ وَلُوُّوا أَنفُسَكُمْ Don't blame me, blame yourselves. Don't blame me, blame yourselves, because you messed up. I didn't do it, I just called you. me. I just called you and you answered. But don't blame me, blame yourselves. And you know what, he's telling the truth. In reality, you can never become anything. You can never reach any level, unless you're willing to look in the mirror and say, I need to change this about myself. I messed up. I got myself into this situation. This is my test, this is my trial, the blame is on me. And there's a direct connection between that and the effect that the shaitan can have on you. I want to take you all to a hadith that you, you're all very familiar with, which is the hadith of Al-Isra wal Mi'raj, narrated by Abu Hurairah al Bukhari, where Rasulullah mentions that on the night of Al-Isra wal Mi'raj, Jibreel alayhi salam presented to him two cups. One of them had milk, laban. One of them had wine, khamar. And the Prophet ﷺ drank from which one? Some, someone actually said the wine. <laughs> he drank from the milk وسلم, and what did Jibreel ﷺ respond? A very beautiful response. He said, Alhamdulillah All praise and thanks be to, be to the one who guided you to the fitrah, who guided you to your origin. And what did Jibreel say to the Prophet And by the way, I'm trying to fit a lot of information into a few minutes, so I apologize if I'm jumping from topic to topic, but this is, you know, a lot of, a lot of material, there's a lot of depth to this hadith. Jibreel said to the Prophet If you were to take the khamar, if you were to take the wine, your ummah would have gone astray. Think about that. If you were to choose the wine, 
your ummah would have gone astray, but you are guided to the fitwa, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And as a result, the entire ummah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam naturally inclines towards good, naturally inclines towards things that are pleasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There are some things that are just human goodness. How many of you heard about Rachel Corey? Raise your hands if you heard about Rachel Corey. 23 year old, white American, non-Muslim, went to Gaza stood in front of a bulldozer and was killed. She wasn't Muslim. She didn't go there seeking shahada. But there is fitra. There is a natural inclination there towards goodness, towards justice, towards compassion. And you know, many times we ignore that. And once we ignore that, then shaitan can start attacking us with all these different things. Because naturally, we incline towards good. You know, there's the whole nature versus nurture argument. You are naturally born good. You don't become a sick serial killer overnight. It takes time. You don't become you know, a fearless thief overnight. It takes time. You don't become a rapist overnight. Those are very major examples. It takes time to get to that level. You start off loving Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What you have to ask yourself is how far did I dig myself deep into the hole? Because that's the question. Now I want you to focus for a moment, and this, this is for those of you that, that subhanAllah, but aren't satisfied with the English translation. And it's, it's really beautiful. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says about shaitan, إِنَّ عِبَادِي لَيْسَ لَكَ عَلَيْهِمْ سُلْطَانِ إِلَّا مَنْ اتَّبَعَكَ مِنَ الْغَاوِينَ You have no power whatsoever over my servants. Stop blaming shaitan. You don't have any power over my servants except for those who follow you from al gawin And the word Gawin is the same word that was used in the hadith, by the way. And the word Gawa, it refers to a person, it refers to a child that refused to breastfeed from the mother. Ref SubhanAllah, just look at the amazing connection between this. It refers to a person who refused to drink the milk. So in essence, what is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala saying? You can't do anything, O Shaytan, to all of those people. You have no power over my servants, except for the ones who refuse guidance. The ones who, who, are, who are trying to turn away from fiqhah. Trying to turn away from the way Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created them. It's a very powerful expression. Imam ibn Qudab rahimahullah, he said, for that reason Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, أَلَيْسَ اللَّهُ بِكَافٍ عَبْدًا isn't Allah enough for his slave? Because once Allah is enough for you, you don't need to worry about that other stuff. Think about this for a moment. Someone becomes Muslim that has indulged in all of the animalistic desires that you can imagine. That Muslim youth are chasing. Right? You know, Muslim youth are trying to find their way sometimes to date, to, to have a halal relationship that will quickly turn halal. If it wasn't haram from the start, will quickly try to find their way, you know, around the shara, around halal and haram, to try to do everything that everyone else is doing. We try to abandon the things that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave to us to make it easier for us. And people come to the deen after having lived out their wildest imaginations and their desires. You've got rappers, you've got celebrities, you've got, you know, subhanAllah, you look at the Abdullah brothers, Hussein, Hamza Abdullah, NFL players, people that achieved their dreams in dunya, and they come to Islam. They come to Islam, and they're ready to abandon all of that, and there's a sense of peace. There's a sense of, of tranquility there. That Alhamdulillah, I got rid of all of that. You know, that, that stuff makes you miserable, it doesn't make you happy. Shaitan got you at one point, but at the end of the day, Allah is so much more. Isn't Allah enough for you? Isn't the deen enough for you? Isn't the pleasure that you would get out of your deen enough for you? SubhanAllah, aren't the halal alternatives that Allah made to haram enough for you to sustain your soul and to make you happy? It's enough for you. And that's really, a, you know, that's where it all comes down to. You know, SubhanAllah, I've met so many different Muslim youth that started off very, very close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as their fitrah, raised as innocent children. Then, you know what, it took one, one guy or one girl. It took one bad friend. It took one person to start pulling them astray. And it's because of their weak personalities, they started to get pulled astray. And initially, they don't feel comfortable with that stuff. SubhanAllah, I remember a young man, and this was, I, I, I'll give you a six month span. 
In the beginning of the six months, a young man comes to me in my masjid, and he's someone that, that's very close to me in the youth group, and he's bursting into tears. He's crying. You know why he's crying? Because he went to a restaurant with a girl, a non-mahram girl. He's crying, right? Six months later, he's committed zina multiple times. He's coming to the masjid for salah and asking me, or he prays salah, and then after salah, he tells me, hey, I prayed without doing ghusl. You see where Allah comes, you see where shaitan takes a person? To dark, 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 dark places. You start off a certain way. There was a sister, I also remember subhanAllah, that, that took off her hijab just, to, just as anger against her father. She said her father forced it upon her, and I'm not, that's a whole other discussion. I'm not even talking about forcing and those types of things. But her father forced it upon her, and her father would hit her if he saw her without hijab. Obviously, terrible parenting skills and things of that sort. But she believed in it, and she would say, I want to wear hijab. I know it's the right thing, but I want to show my, I want to teach my dad a lesson. Took off her hijab, went to school. The first day, she was so uncomfortable, subhanAllah, she was wearing a hoodie. She threw a hoodie on her. Think about that for a moment. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala takes you to different places. Now, unfortunately, it, it, it went very, very, very far. Right? It starts off at a small point, but it goes very, very, very far. It's just like the person that starts off with a text messaging conversation. Starts off with a, with, a, with, a, with a G chat or a Facebook chat and is throwing in a little bit too many, you know, too many smiley faces all of a sudden and too many LOLs, you know, in their MSA emails or whatever emails it is or, or whatever, throwing in a lot of smiley faces, you know, and then it gets a little too friendly. Then you know what? We're boyfriend and girlfriend. We're going to get married in two years and I'll tell my dad after two years and I'll tell my mom after two years. Then it'll, it'll all work out. Think about that for a moment. Now what does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala say? Because I only have a few moments. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Al-Shams, قَدْ أَفْلَحَ مَنْ زَكَّاهَ What a successful person he is who managed to purify himself, to remain close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They didn't blame shaitan, they didn't blame external influences, blame themselves consistently, you know, turn back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and wash themselves. وَقَدْ خَابَ مَنْ دَسَّاهَ and he has failed who has thrown dirt on it. Dasaha, dasawtuha, that literally means to throw dirt on something. Throwing dirt on, on, on yourself, throwing dirt on your soul, and distance yourself from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala after Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made a way for them. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave them enough satisfaction, enough to make them happy. Your fitrah is to be happy and to be satisfied with your Creator and to also be satisfying to your Creator. That's your fitrah. That's how we were born. That's what our soul is like. And subhanAllah, we see from the Prophet wasallam, even at night, he taught us that we should be in a state of tazkiyah. Because that's the only time that we're not able to purify ourselves. We're not, we're not conscious, obviously, when we're sleeping. But even at that time, what did the Prophet wasallam say? He would say to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, فَإِنْ أَمْسَكْتَ نَفْسِي If you hold my soul, فَاخْفِرْ لَهَا وَرْحَمْهَا Then forgive it and be mercy, merciful with it. Why? Because at night, Allah يَتَوَفُدْ, يتوفد أَنْفُسِ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala holds the souls every single night. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala decides whether or not to return them to our bodies. But at that moment, even when you go to sleep, you're supposed to tell Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Oh Allah, if you're going to keep it with you, Forgive it and show mercy to it. وَإِنْ أَرْسَلْتَهَا And if you send it back, فَحْفَظْهَا بِمَا تَحْفَظُ بِهِ عِبَادِكَ الصَّالِحِينَ Then protect it the way that you protect your righteous servants. SubhanAllah. It's like I am in complete submission and I want, I want you to show me the way. I'm not going to look for the loopholes. I'm not going to blame anybody else. I messed up. I got myself in certain situations. I threw stuff on my fitrah. I corrupted my fitrah because I took the wine and I didn't take the milk. And I hope that's not literal for many of us, but I took the wine and I didn't take the milk. I refused to take the milk. I refused to take what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave me, which was already so precious. And I'll give you one quick analogy, and this is the end, I promise. One quick analogy. SubhanAllah is a very powerful analogy, actually from a convert. And this brother, is, you know, if you listen to people sometimes, they're not scholars, they're not imams, they're not du'a, but they say things that are just so profound. This brother was the drug dealer in New Orleans. And New Orleans has some heavy drug dealing. And he was the man in terms of drug dealing. 
And subhanAllah, after Islam, when I say he cleaned his life up, he didn't just clean his life up. More than 50 or 60 people have taken shahad on his hands, just a few years. He's cleaning everybody else up too. And you know the analogy that he gave me? He said, if you look at the Muslim youth today, they're like people that are driving around a 1970 or 1980 Toyota Corolla that's all banged up on hubcaps. Or I'm sorry, they're driving around Ferraris and driving around Lamborghinis and they're looking to people who have 1980, whatever it is, Toyota Corollas with hubcaps. With, with hub and they're thinking to themselves, man, I want that car. I want that car. Allah gave you something that is already so profound, that already satisfies you, and is in fact the only thing that can satisfy the soul, that can feed the soul. Because just as the body is fed from its origin, the soul is also fed from its origin, which is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah already gave us enough. When you start looking right and left for other things, you're the guy or you're the girl that's refusing to drink milk. And in Islam, you can't be spiritually lactose intolerant. So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to protect us, inshaAllah. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to, to purify our souls. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he used to say, Allahumma aati nafsi taqwaha. Oh Allah, give my soul its taqwa. Wa zakiha anta khayru man zakaha. And purify, you are the best of those who purify. Anta waliyuha wa mawlaha. You are its protector and you are its master. So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, our master and our protector, to purify our souls as He is the best of those who purify. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to protect us from the shaytan and all of his calls. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us amongst those who are satisfied with Allah as our Lord, with Islam as our deen, and with Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam as our prophet and messenger. Allahumma ameen. Jazakallah khayran. Aqulu qabihada wa astaghfirullah wa barakatuh. Assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.